much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's 1974 and Suzanne Savakis is four years old. She's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl with a bubbly smile, round cheeks and a thick fringe. Her mother recently married a man she met on a bus in Dallas, Texas. His name is Brandon Williams. Although he hasn't known Suzanne for very long, Brandon's about to become her primary caregiver for 30 days when her mother Sandy is imprisoned for a misdemeanor. In 1986, Sharon Marshall is completing her final year of high school in Forest Park, Georgia. She's a bright teenager with an even brighter future. She's just been awarded a full scholarship to Georgia Tech University to study aerospace engineering. At home, it's just Sharon and her father, Warren Marshall. The other parents from school don't like their kids going over to the Marshall house. There are whispers about why a father, who seemingly didn't work, would expect so much from his daughter around the house. Sharon cleans and cooks his every meal, in between her studies and burgeoning social life. Warren is a strict man, but he's proud of his daughter. It's 1990 in Tampa, Florida, where Tonya Hughes works as a dancer in a club called Passions. She's only 20 years old, but it's not the first strip club she's worked at. She works hard to support her husband and their two-year-old son, Michael. Clarence Hughes, Tonya's 41-year-old husband, spends every night with Michael waiting in the car park for Tonya to finish her shift. The other girls at the club don't like him. They think that there's something not quite right about the way he watches her. What kind of husband wants his wife stripping in a place like this anyway? They gossip. These stories span thousands of miles. A stepfather with a young girl in his care. A teenage girl, dutiful to her reserved father. A husband and wife with an energetic little boy. Suzanne, Brandon, Sharon, Warren, Tonya, Clarence. But what if I told you only one of these names is real and the rest of them carefully crafted or stolen identities that made up a web of deceit created by one of the most sinister fugitives in American history, a man named Franklin Delano Floyd. Franklin Floyd spent 10 years in prison in the 60s. After getting out, he didn't report to his parole officer and was missing for the next 17 years. He was an expert in being on the run and knew how to conceal his identity. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In April 1990, 21-year-old Tonya Hughes was found dead on the side of a highway. The investigation into her death, which initially seemed like a straightforward hit and run, would lead police to uncover a violent trail of lies, abuse, false identities, kidnapping and murder spanning multiple decades. Journalist Matt Birkbeck, our guest today, spent years researching this case for his books, A Beautiful Child and Finding Sharon, and played an integral role in uncovering the true identity of Tonya Hughes, the woman found dead on the road outside Oklahoma all those years ago. In the process of his investigation, Matt spoke to many key figures of the case, including the man behind her death, Franklin Floyd himself. Matt worked as the executive producer of the Netflix original documentary Girl in the Picture, adapted from the detailed findings of his books and investigations. Matt joins me now. 
Matt, there are so many places that we could start with this story, so many layers. It's overwhelming. But I guess first off, I'd love to know how you became caught up in this case. How did it become a part of your life and why? I first heard of the case way back in 2002, just over 20 years ago. A woman I had met when I was in Texas reporting on what would become my first book on Robert Durst. And she knew that I was writing for other several magazines here in the States, including People magazine. And I would usually do human interest and crime stories, not necessarily the celebrity stories. And she just sent me this photograph this one day. It was in the spring of 2002. And so, yeah, I take a look at this. And it was a photograph of this little girl sitting in this man's lap. It was supposed to be a father and daughter picture. And I just looked at it and I just said, there's something wrong with this because he looked creepy and she looked like there was just something wrong. You know, she was unsmiling. Her hair wasn't cut well. You could just tell just looking at the photograph that something wasn't right here. And then there's, you know, there was a line that, you know, you go down and you click and then there's a line that said that he kidnapped her as a toddler, raised her as his daughter, married her, and then he killed her. And I just said, oh, my God. And then that's when I started digging into it. And, you know, it was a 20-year journey. Let's take it back to April 1990. A woman's body is found in a suspected hit-and-run accident. What can you tell me about those circumstances? So this young woman, they identified as Tanya Hughes, was found on a road by three men who were driving to a nearby motel. And she had been injured, severely injured, in what appeared to be a hit-and-run accident. And they called an ambulance, and she was taken to the hospital. She was married to a man whose name was Clarence Hughes, who was much older than her. And she also had a two-year-old son named Michael. And they were from Tulsa, Oklahoma. She was found in Oklahoma City. They had been staying in a nearby motel. And he showed up to the hospital, the husband, and basically his behavior alerted them that something wasn't right here. And she ends up passing away within a week. There are inquiries made not by police or even the coroner who ruled it a hit and run accident, but by friends of this, of Tanya, she was a stripper at the time. She was working at a strip club in Tulsa. They suggested that he had killed her, only there was no proof to it. And that's basically where the story takes off. That's where I actually started the story off in the book, A Beautiful Child. Were the injuries that Tanya had sustained in line with what medical professionals would expect from a hit and run? Some of the injuries were, I mean, there were some bruises on her, but there was one particular injury to the back of her head and it could have been a hit and run, but most people believe that she had been struck with an object by somebody. And of course, you know, that somebody everyone believed was her husband. So there was a lot of conjecture at the time, especially from the girls she had worked with. People believed that he had something to do with her death but they could never prove it. You know, plus she was a stripper, so the police didn't really take it seriously. There really wasn't much that they did at that time. What do we know about Tonya's life in her final weeks, months leading up to her death? That community of girls, the colleagues that she worked with at the club, why did they have reason to think that she may have been killed by her husband? So she and her husband had arrived in Tulsa eight, nine months earlier, and they had come from New Orleans. And the second they got there, she gets a job at this seedy little strip club called Passions. And she's working six nights a week. She barely talks to anyone. She makes a couple of friends, doesn't really talk. She spends most of her time reading different magazines and whatnot. And the girls there all know that she has a two-year-old son. The husband, who's much older than her, no one really likes, he drops her off. He takes care of the son. He won't let the son out of his sight. So for all intents and purposes, her purpose in life is really just to make money to give to her husband, Clarence. Slowly over the months, she makes friends with some of these girls. 
some of them genuinely like her. She has a disarming personality. She's very smart. And she then makes plans. You know, they see this relationship and they see something is really off with it between this husband and wife. And she makes plans to leave him. What people don't realize is that she's making plans to leave him because of his interest in their supposed son. He's the father. At least that's what everyone was told. And his sole interest is in the boy. And her goal at this point in time is to basically drum up the courage to leave him and to run with her son, Michael. Unfortunately, he finds out about it, and that's when they go to Oklahoma City. What was her relationship like with Clarence at the time? You know, he was interested in her son. She feared for her safety and his safety. Why? He's violent, abusive. He beats her. He sexually abuses her. Unbeknownst to everyone there, she had been with him for a very long time. And, you know, she's either going to continue to live this horrific life that she's living or she's going to make a stand and save her son. And she ultimately makes this decision to save her son and leave him. What was her relationship like with her son, a two-year-old, Michael? What kind of a mother was she? She was as good as she could be, given the circumstances. She loved her son. He was the light of her life. He was the only good thing in her life at that point in time. And her friends could see it. You know, it was a very sad situation. They all fell for her. And these are really hardened women. I had interviewed several of them when I went to Tulsa in 2003. I mean, most of the women were young there at the time, or in their early 20s or so. And Tanya had told them she was 22, I believe it was, 21, 22. You know, there were these are girls that are dancing in a really, really nasty strip club. You know, they were kind of in this together and they kind of fended for each other and they told each other their secrets and what was going on with their lives in terms of the men that were in their lives. And despite the circumstances of each of their own lives, it was a pretty tight knit group. Did that make Clarence uncomfortable? Do you think that Tonya had a community around her, that there were people concerned for her safety? Yeah, not at that point in time. At that point in time, the only thing that she meant to him was a source of revenue. He didn't work, claimed he had a bad back. You know, he was a painter by trade, or at least he told people he was. I mean, he had painted before. He spent his time playing cards. One thing he did do was before they ended up in Tulsa, they had lived in different cities in America. And he had always befriended law enforcement with local police departments, which was strange. But at this point in time, he wasn't working. He was watching Michael. And the only thing that she meant to him was as someone that was going to bring home money every night so they could have a roof over their heads and dinner on the table. The way that you have described Passions, the strip club in Tulsa, paints a very different picture to another club that's part of this story, Mons Venus. What can you tell me about that place and Tonya's time there, the people that she met, and how they perceived her relationship with this husband figure? So she arrived in Tulsa in the summer of ninety. And it was a couple of years earlier when they arrived in Tampa under completely different circumstances where they weren't husband and wife. He was her father. She was Sharon Marshall, and she had been Sharon Marshall for a number of years. He was Warren Marshall. Michael was born in 1988, I believe. So he was an infant at that time. And when they got to Tampa, Mons Venus was the creme de la creme of strip clubs in Florida, or particularly in, that, in the west coast of Florida, in Tampa area. Rock stars went there. Athletes went there. Famous athletes went there. It was a place that attracted beautiful women who dressed in beautiful clothing. And it was very well known and very famous for its clientele. And she arrived there and she works there and she's very shy initially, but then she becomes one of the crew, so to speak. She has one really good friend there, a woman by the name of Michelle Camesso, 
And she also had another friend there who was the manager, a woman named Heather, who had been a dancer for a number of different years. And she was beautiful, Heather. She could have been, you know, a model in New York, for instance. And she was kind of like a den mother amongst the girls that danced there. And, you know, once they got there, they stayed in place. They, they lived in a trailer park. They didn't move so quickly as they had before. The only thing, well, really just the only thing, but it was real, one really big red flag was that when she worked, her father now, her so-called father, Warren, would drive her to the club, drop her off, and then he would stay there in the parking lot all night long waiting for her to come out with the baby, with Michael in the back seat. And now the girls got wind of this pretty quickly, obviously. And it really creeped them out because you're talking about women. Many of them had been sexually abused, particularly by relatives. And they thought something was up with Sharon and her father. But they, you know, they love Sharon in that she was sweet. She read. She was always searching for knowledge. It was just something, it was different with her as opposed to the other girls that were there. And she she remained there for a good year and a half, two years. Did it raise alarm bells within the Mons Venus circle that a father, Warren as he's known at this time, was either making or encouraging his young daughter to work in an environment like that? Yeah, there were two things that happened here that really got the attention of people there. Heather used to do these parties. And these were high-end parties, and Sharon wanted to go with her. You know, what Heather didn't know at the time was that Sharon was being prompted by Warren to go. And then once she agreed to take Sharon and Warren learned about it, he insisted that he drive them to these parties. Heather agreed, but then things got really weird with Warren in that he talked about getting his so-called daughter you know, with the way he would term it a boob job, you know, he wanted to get her into pornography and he talked about it openly, you know, it kind of excited him. And that really, really turned Heather off. And, you know, Warren wanted to come and watch as they were, you know, with clients, they would go to different hotels and he would want to come and watch. So Heather developed a decided opinion of Warren. And she also shared that opinion with the other girls in Mons Venus, which just disgusted them all. The other thing was with Cheryl Camesso, who's a young woman. She was 18, 19 years old. She was originally from New York. She ends up in Florida. Very pretty, dark hair, just not very bright, very naive. And her goal in life is to be a star. But for her to be a star was to be in Playboy magazine. You know, she became Sharon's best friend at Mons and would go to the trailer where Sharon and Warren lived together. And somehow she allowed... Warren to convince her that he could take pictures and get her into Playboy magazine and also a video. And Sharon and Cheryl do this video on a beach and it's pretty suggestive. And for whatever reason, Cheryl decides to show the video to the other girls at the Mons. And they just start laughing at her saying, you know, why would you do something that, so you crazy? And she said, no, you know, Warren said he'd get me into Playboy. And they were like, Warren, Warren Marshall? You know, they were incredulous. And then she realized she had been taken. And that's when the events in Florida began to get out of hand. What happened to Cheryl Camesso? So Cheryl, realizing she had been deceived, decides she's going to get some payback. And she calls the... Florida Department of Human Services, in addition to working at the club and making cash at the club, Sharon was getting welfare checks for herself and for her son, which was another source of income from Warren. Again, he didn't really work. And when Cheryl called up the state, they stopped the checks and Warren found out about it. And he was furious. And there was a confrontation in front of the club Heather, the manager, got involved. It looked like Warren was going to grab Cheryl and into his truck. They broke it up. Warren drove away. And it wasn't long after that when Cheryl Camesso disappeared. We'll come back to the disappearance of Cheryl Camesso, but I want to move forward to April 1990 after Tonya Hughes 
or Sharon has died in that hit and run that we have discussed. She has a two-year-old son. People around her are suspicious that she's met with foul play. What happens next? What happens to her son, Michael? So Michael subsequently taken away by child services after they realized that Clarence Hughes, the father, upon Tanya's death now, her name was Tanya, she had an insurance policy that he had taken on her. And he tried to cash in on that policy. Only when he gave several different social security numbers and they were all wrong and they got wind of it, he was subsequently arrested. His name was not Clarence Hughes. His real name was Franklin Delano Floyd. And he was a federal fugitive who had been on the run for some 17 years. He had been released from prison in 1973 after serving 10 years for bank robbery, as well as for raping a young child. So after he disappears in 1973, he believes that the FBI is on his trail, which wasn't necessarily true. No one was really looking for him, but he believed because he was a fugitive that he was always in danger. So because he violated his parole, they sent him to prison. And he goes there for two years. Michael is sent to a foster home with a very nice couple named Ernest and Merle Dean. And they've had kids in their home. They, I think at last count, they had maybe, they've watched over maybe 80 kids or something like that over a number of years. But this is a place where, where troubled kids go. And they sent Michael there, and he was a wreck when he got there. Couldn't communicate, wouldn't drink his bottle. He was an emotional wreck. Over the course of the next two, three, four years, the beans turn him from that emotional wreck into this beautifully adjusted little boy who's now going to kindergarten and then goes to first grade and is now enrolled in first grade. Warren, or Clarence, or Franklin Floyd, these are the different names he goes by. <laughs> He gets out of prison. Well, he's he's fighting for custody. He's claiming that he's Michael's father. They do a DNA test, and he's not the father. He was getting visitation rights while the testing was going on. Once the testing came in, he was denied visitation. And at the same time, the Beans were going to adopt Michael. So he does the unthinkable, and he goes into Michael's first grade class, and he kidnaps him at gunpoint from the school, and he takes off. And Michael is never seen again. Someone else was kidnapped or taken in that situation as well. What can you tell me about what happened to one of the staff at the school? So when he walked into the school, he walked into the principal's office. And he said that he's not going to leave the school alive unless he gets his son. So with the principal, they go to Michael's first grade classroom. And then when Michael comes out, the three of them get into the principal's truck and they drive a couple of miles away and he ties the principal to a tree. He duct tapes into a tree and he's subsequently found a couple of hours later. But within a very short period, a few hours, the FBI is called. And that's because they believe that he crossed the state line. And that's when we are introduced to an FBI agent by the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. To understand the sort of person that Franklin was, obviously his crimes paint a significant picture, but through the eyes of a child, it's interesting to understand what Michael thought of him. What did his foster parents describe as Michael's behaviour or impression of his, you know, supposed biological father? How did he behave when he did have those visits? So Michael wasn't happy with it at all. He didn't want to visit him. He would call him a bad man. But the Beans had no choice because it was state ordered. So they had to agree to drop him off. And Michael had to visit with him. And Floyd would buy him toys and try to curry favor with him. In his mind, he was kind of rekindling a relationship that they never really had. That went on for several months. And Michael would come back from these visits and he would be very disturbed. The news reports on Michael's kidnapping are extensive and they stretch far. Obviously, there's major concern for his safety given Franklin Floyd's real identity, what happened to Michael's mother. How did that reporting lead to more revelations about Tonya or Sharon 
and her identity, who she was? So some of the truth started to come out about who she really was. You know, first it was she was the wife. And then after the kidnapping, it took several weeks. He was ultimately captured. You know, the FBI was trying, Joe Fitzpatrick, the agent on the case, was trying to get as much information as he could. But it was really, it was hard. You know, the information came in slowly at the time. And then ultimately he's captured. But what really turned the case around and opened up the eyes of the FBI to what was really going on here and which led them on this path to discover some of this new information was when a young woman from Georgia who saw the news reports of the kidnapping and made the national news, a young woman named Jenny Fisher was talking to her mother one night and her mother was frantically telling her that Sharon was on the news, her friend Sharon, and that Sharon was dead. Now, Jenny and Sharon had gone to high school together in Atlanta, Georgia, in the early to mid-80s. They were best friends. And then she lost contact with her for several years. And the news report says they don't know who this girl is. They don't know who the woman is, meaning Sharon. And she calls the FBI in Oklahoma City. And she's got this incredible story. You know, all the FBI knows is that she was a stripper in Tulsa, and they believed in Oklahoma City, but it was really just in Tulsa. They don't know too much about her. Ultimately, they bring Jenny to Oklahoma City, and Jenny tells them, we were high school classmates together. She was a brilliant student. She had a full scholarship to Georgia Tech University. She was going to study to become an aerospace engineer, and her goal was to work for NASA on the space shuttle. And that just blew everyone away. There was a step that her supposed father, Warren, took in light of that university scholarship that made a lot of people feel uncomfortable. It had something to do with a newspaper ad. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what it reveals about Warren? So Sharon had gotten a Air Force ROTC scholarship to go to Georgia Tech. She was going to get a full ride to go to college. And, you know, again, she was very, very well liked in high school. And she was a very, very good friend to Jenny Fisher and to several other students. You know, she was basically helping them out of their teenage difficulties at a time where they knew there was something odd with Sharon and her father. You know, she had to be home every day at four o'clock to clean and cook for him. You know, he was an oddball at the time. But because she was doing so well in school, No one really thought that there was anything diabolical going on. But, you know, rumors started to pop up that he might have been just too overbearing. She would go on dates and he would accompany her. She'd go to the movies with a boyfriend. He'd be sitting there right next to them. And then things got even weirder when she got the scholarship. And in their yearbook that year, he took out a full page ad with her in a somewhat, I'd say, suggestive top. I mean, it wasn't appropriate for a high school student. You know, it was a little too sexy. It was like a glamour shot. Exactly. It wasn't appropriate for a high school yearbook, much less congratulating your daughter. But he did it. And, you know, congratulations, you know, to my daughter. And he spelled aeronautical wrong. And it really caught the attention of a lot of people. And, you know, Sharon had actually been brought in. She had gained some weight. And, you know, a couple of teachers had asked her, one in particular asked her, A, if she was pregnant. She denied it. And there were also some questions about whether or not, you know, was your father being inappropriate with you? And, of course, she denied that, too. And as it turned out, she was pregnant, which basically changed the course of her life from going to college to leaving high school and going to Arizona. What did Jenny Fisher, her high school friend, reveal about, perhaps the more sinister side of their supposed father-daughter relationship. This was a story that she had never told the police when she was interviewed in 1995. It was a story she told me in two parts. The first one was in 2003 when I met her in Atlanta. And then a really horrific part she told me in 2016 in New Orleans when we were taping a TV program. And Warren had taken the two girls out for a night. You know, they're only 16 years old. 
And he told him to go get dressed up. I'm going to take you out to a club. And he took him to a club. He brings him into a club. He apparently knows the people at the club. And he leaves him there. And it's filled with much older men. So Jenny is very, very uncomfortable. She's never done this before. Sharon, on the other hand, appears to be very comfortable, as if she has done this before. She's not letting her surroundings bother her in any way. The girls are dancing together. Guys come up to them. Sharon just shoes them away like she had done it a million times before. As it turns out, they're actually having a pretty good time. Warren comes and picks them up. Jenny's sleeping over. Jenny had asked her mother time and time again if she could sleep over Sharon's house. And her mother said, absolutely not, because they did not like Warren Marshall. They like Sharon. They love Sharon. They did not like her father. And this one time, her father was away for the weekend. He was a pilot. And the mother relented and let Jenny sleep over. So after they leave this club, they go back to the Marshall's house. It's a small house just outside of Atlanta. And Warren tells me we're going to change for bed. Jenny notices that Sharon's got all this very sexy clothing. You know, far too sexy for a 16-year-old girl. And they're going through it and all of that. And they're laughing and giggling. And then all of a sudden, Warren bolts in and he's holding a gun. And he starts screaming at them to get dressed and to get into bed. Jenny is horrified. I mean, she's traumatized, actually. And then just like that, Warren starts laughing. And, you know, claims it was just a joke what he was doing. And what she told me years later was that not only did he burst in there and brandish a gun, but he also raped Sharon in the bed and did it with Jenny right there next to her on the floor. And, you know, it's something that Jenny tells in the film, in Grown the Picture. And it was the first time she's ever told it publicly. So, you know, it was something that she kept to her all these years. But it was a, obviously, it was just an awful, awful night. When Sharon does fall pregnant, it changes the course of her life. Why is that? Is she allowed to go to uni? Does she have a relationship with the father of the child? What happens next? This is the craziness of Franklin Floyd. So he has a supposed daughter that he's raised who's been abused all of her life, particularly by him. He's very proud with her getting a scholarship. But when he finds out she's pregnant, he just flips. Somehow she just soiled herself there in his mind. And she's not worthy of a college scholarship. Instead, she's going to come with him and they're going to go to Arizona. And she goes to school on graduation day, but she does not participate in graduation ceremonies. And then within a couple of weeks after that, the marshals are gone and they take off for Arizona. And then a couple of weeks later, Sharon writes Jenny a letter and tells her that she gave birth in Texas and that they gave the baby to two doctors there. And there's never been any evidence that they ever gave the baby up anywhere, much less the two doctors in Texas. Or at least we've never found it over these years. And she goes to Arizona, and I think Jenny maybe hears from Sharon one more time, and then that's it. Did Jenny know who the father of that baby really was? No. I mean, there have been some names that have come up on who the father may have been. There's a couple of high school students that she had dated. There was one boy who actually left with them at that time, believing he was the father. And when they got to Arizona, he was working and supporting both Warren and Sharon. And then one day he comes in and there's two child welfare workers, supposedly from Arizona. And Sharon walks him to the bedroom and says, the baby's not yours. And he's furious and he leaves them. You know, he had been supporting them for months. So to this day, he doesn't know what the true story is. He doesn't know if he truly was the father. There are a couple of remaining mysteries and that is one of them. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with author Matt Burbeck about uncovering the true identity of the girl in the picture. So in the years that follow, 
this couple, whether they're father and daughter or husband and wife, move around the country a great deal. Eventually, you know, we know that Tonya or Sharon dies. Michael, her son, is kidnapped. We know that he's kidnapped by an on-the-run fugitive, Franklin Floyd, you know, who we in this story have heard of as Clarence or Warren. How and when is Franklin apprehended after that kidnapping? So he was tracked down by Joe Fitzpatrick, the FBI agent. They decide to check with certain states where they believed he had lived to see if maybe he had applied for a driver's license, either under his real name or one of his assumed names. And as it turns out, he did apply for one in Florida, and it was being sent to an address in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's where they found him, and that's where they arrested him. And that was in late 1994. The following spring, he went on trial, and he was convicted of kidnapping Michael. He would never say what happened to Michael. You know, basically his story was that he gave him up, and some people have him, and he's in good care, which was a lie. But he was sentenced to 55 years in prison. It was during that trial when, and this was another, just one of these incredible coincidences with this story. It was during that trial when a mechanic in Kansas who had gotten the truck that Floyd used, and he's underneath it, and he sees this envelope, pulls it out, he opens it up, and there's a hundred or so photographs. They're lurid photos of young girls. Many of them are of Sharon. And there's also a group of photos of a young woman who was half naked. It was clear she was either dead or near death. She had been beaten violently. And around that same time, a skeleton is found in St. Petersburg, Florida. And the police there spend a year trying to identify it, and they can't. It isn't until a year after the trial where the FBI sends them these photographs. There were several events that took place in between, but ultimately they get these photographs, and it turns out it was Cheryl Comesso. The skeleton that they found was Cheryl Comesso, and he's charged with the murder of Cheryl Comesso. He was ultimately convicted in 2001 of murdering her, and he was sentenced to death and placed on death row. We've spoken about a girl called Sharon, a woman named Tonya, a man, Clarence Warren Franklin. None of these identities are the true identity of the girl in the picture that first intrigued you those years ago. How do we find out who she really is? What was the missing piece that brought it together? So, you know, my goal was hopefully to find her identity as I was doing this. You know, I traveled across the country interviewing people. You know, I put the story together. My biggest task with writing the first book, A Beautiful Child, was how am I going to tell this incredible story and then hope that it resonates with people to the point where they're going to want to find her identity. Because I didn't have it by the time I finished. So the book came out in 2004. This is before, you know, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And we had different websites that were looking for her and sending us tips as to who she may be. What ultimately happened was that in 2011, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children here in the States decides they're going to take another look at the case. The caseworker knew nothing about the story. They had my book in their case files. She goes and reads it. She falls in love with Sharon. And she now has to jump on this. She decides she's going to bring the FBI in on it. She calls the FBI in Oklahoma City. They don't know anything about it. You know, they handle hundreds of cases a month. And to them, this was something that they never would have even looked at. But it turns out they had the book in their files. And the uh, lead FBI agent, Scott Lobb, reads the book. And he's floored with Sharon's story. Her courage and her ability to just try to succeed amidst this horror was just amazing. And so the FBI decide, you know, they put together a plan to interview Franklin Floyd in prison. And in 2014, they go and meet with him, and he does something that he had never done before, not with me and not with, you know, other interviewers and other FBI agents. 
he tells them Sharon's real identity. Her name was Suzanne Savakis. And he had gotten her in early 1970s after he fled, after he violated his parole. He ends up in South Carolina. He's a bus driver, meets her mother, and she's got three daughters. And he ultimately marries her within a week. You know, the daughters had been taken by the state. And by marrying Floyd, she gets them back. They end up in Texas. She's in jail on some kind of a charge for 30 days. And he takes off with her. That's the story. And that's the story that the FBI was able to confirm from him. You know, I called the mother who, I mean, talking to her, it didn't seem like she cared one way or the other, which was really sad. And I did find the father, Cliff Savakis. He turned out to be a very nice man. And he had given up custody of his daughter in the early 1970s. He was young. He had just gotten home from Vietnam. They were divorced. He had married the mother. You know, she ends up now with two other children from two other fathers, and she wants to get married. Well, Cliff give up custody of Suzanne, and he agrees, which he regrets to this day, to do it. So ultimately, that's how we find out that her real name is Suzanne Savakis. And then they go back, and he confesses to killing Michael not long after he kidnapped him within hours near the Oklahoma border. Michael was resisting him. After he was taken and Floyd realized this was not going to work and Floyd claimed that he brought him to a remote area near the Texas border and he shot him twice in the head and he left his remains there. The FBI searched it. It was years later and we're hoping maybe they find something like some clothing or a belt buckle or something and they didn't. But they're pretty convinced that he had told the truth because the way they went about preparing for this interview was remarkable and the way they were able to get him to confess to both her identity as well as killing Michael is something that law enforcement should be studying everywhere. And then ultimately we, you know, the one thing I always wanted to do was change her headstone in Tulsa, Oklahoma. When she was buried in 1990, all it said was Tanya. And, you know, my hope at that point in time, when I first got involved was, you know, hopefully we'll find her identity and we could change the name. And that's what we did in 2017. And People came from across the country and it turned out to be a beautiful ceremony. And so, you know, it now says her headstone now says Suzanne Savakis. So many people, yourself included, Joe Fitzpatrick, the investigators who worked tirelessly to find out who she really was, to find out what happened to Michael, to bring some justice. Some of them worked on this case through to their retirement. It still stayed with them after retirement, that there was so much unknown and unsolved. Even for you, finishing a book with the frustration of the lingering questions, why do you think this story meant so much to those people, to yourself? Why did it resonate in such a way? It was about her. Her name is Suzanne. I still call her Sharon, whether that's right or wrong, because I called her Sharon for so many years. But it was just about her. She was just human and managed to do so many amazingly good things, particularly with her friends and how she mattered to them. I mean, even to this day, it's like 30, 40 years later. And, you know, you talk to them about her and they cry. It's the kind of story where you read about a very rare human spirit and you want to do everything you can to help that person. In this case, it was someone who was dead. So we wanted to find her identity, you know, and then from finding her identity, try to find her family, which is what we did. So, you know, there were a number of people, obviously, that were involved in this for so many years. Joe Fitzpatrick, for one, you know, who I still talk to often. Hardened FBI agents, you know, their hearts melt when they talk about Sharon. So it was just about her. She was a very, very special spirit. And it was just something that really just, you know, drew us all in. And, you know, we really wanted to do something good. I want to ask you about being in the room with the man who probably killed Suzanne, who we know killed Cheryl Comesso, who we know killed little Michael. What was it like sitting in front of him? How did you prepare yourself for that conversation? So I was just hoping to get 20 minutes with him. 
because he was on death row. He had just been convicted and he was about to be shipped off to a state prison in the northern part of Florida. So he was still in St. Petersburg. I was just hoping to meet him so I could get an idea of what he was about. And then when I go in there, you know, he's got handcuffs on and there are two deputies in there with us. And he's got these boxes next to him, which I had no idea what they were. Turns out he had represented himself at trial and they were discovery material. And he asked them to take the handcuffs off. They do. And then they leave. And it's just me and him in the room. Now, it was a small room. He had just been convicted of murder. I knew he killed at least three people. I'm sure he killed many more. So I did feel a little, I'm not going to lie, I did feel a little nervous in the beginning. But as he talked, he just, he wouldn't stop talking. He just had this thing where he would just rant and rant and rant and rant. He had so much to get out of his system. And then he got to his documents and his documents were just so valuable to me, just in terms of a treasure trove of information, all of Sharon's information, school records, you know, doctor visits, autopsy report, all kinds of stuff he had. And he let me make copies of it. Where the interview went off the deep end was about two hours in, and he starts showing me these photographs of Shell Camesso, which I kind of described to you earlier, which was just brutally disgusting. You know, he was trying to show me, he was convicted in part on a thumb, on a photograph of a thumb inside of Shell's thigh, and he was trying to convince me it wasn't his thumb, and he could see I'm revolted by this photograph. And you know, he finally admits, yeah, you know, this is a disgusting photograph, you know, but I'm innocent. I'm like, all right, hold off. Let me go outside. Let me go get some water. I had to get I had to get myself together, which I did. I ended up going back in there. I spent another two hours with him. And I came out of that interview fully convinced that he was probably the personification of evil. I mean, he had a brutal upbringing himself. He was sent to an orphanage. He was raped in, as a young child you know, brutalized, you know, over the years. I get it, but nothing can excuse his behavior for what he did to Sharon, to Michael, to Cheryl Camesso, and probably to many others. So I actually, I left him after four hours. I actually went to visit him a year later after he got transferred. And after the book came out, he had read the book and he was not happy with me. Thankfully, there was a clear plexiglass between us this time. So he just went, he went on a rant for two hours, was just screaming and yelling and whatnot. And I said goodbye to him and that was it. Did he give you any sense emotionally in those meetings that he felt pain over the loss of these people, whether or not he took ownership of his part in it? Do you think he loved Sharon? Do you think he cared for Michael? So he would... No, to answer your questions, no. But he would, you know, he would talk about Sharon, how good she was. I mean, there's a couple of clips in the film in Girl in the Picture. There's maybe 30 seconds of my interview with him that you'll hear. And he talks about how smart she was, how beautiful it was. And he would, you know, he praise her. And then the very next breath, he says just some really disgusting things. And he just flipped like that. And you could see his psyche. You could tell it was he was off. There was something really wrong with this man, psychologically. Michael, I'm sure he, in his own mind, he may have cared about Michael because after he killed Michael, he did go to a mental hospital in Atlanta. He checked himself in, and he was there for seven days for what the hospital described as a severe traumatic event. So that's what everyone believes was him trying to come to terms with the fact that he actually killed the boy. So, yeah, maybe he did. But at the end of the day, no, because he just lied for so many for so many years. So, no, he never, ever took ownership of anything until the very end. You know, he just died four weeks ago. He finally died in prison. And when the FBI agents, the two FBI agents, did that incredible interview with him, and they finally got him to admit Sharon's identity, and then later they went back and they got him to admit Kelly Michael, it's the only time i ever known when he's actually said something that was true or admitted to a truth or took ownership of something. People have asked me over the years, you know, do you have any empathy for him? No, not at all. I don't. There's nothing to feel bad for. He was, you know, just a, like I said before, evil is the, you know, perfect description of Franklin Floyd, given, you know, all the damage he'd done over, over his life. 
you've spent over 20 years investigating and reporting on this case. It's obviously a story you think is important to tell. What is it that you want us to understand most about Suzanne and her story? You know, when I wrote the book, I didn't want to dwell. I mean, it's such a horrific story. And if you wanted to embellish it, you could. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be able to tell her story in such a way where, yeah, there's all these traumatic and evil and horrific events that take place. But above it all, you really feel for her. She's just a beautiful human being that was caught in this horrific situation. No doing of her own. It was just fell into it as a young child. And where 99.9% of the population would have just given in and probably died much earlier than she did, she didn't. And she succeeded. She exceeded all expectations. And I think that's the most remarkable part of it. And that's the part that I think we all celebrate every time we ever talk about her. A huge thanks to Matt for helping us tell this story. You can find a link to both of Matt's books in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer is Gia Moylan with assistant production by Cassie Merritt. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you could leave us a review on whichever podcast app you're listening to right now. It helps other true crime fans find our content and it helps us to keep making the episodes you get to enjoy every week. And if you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. You can send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.